Okay, here it is. Here's our report. We have Shannon listening, and Mary, and James and Alice, and Joe Abaya, and Kim Halverson, and the Harrises, and Yuko, and TC, and Doug and Stacy, and Shelly Peach, and Ann Herbig, and Dan Allen, and Chris and Debbie Trefi, and Joe Lay so far. How exciting is that? Welcome. We're so, so glad that you're here this morning. We apologize on, on like, my behalf. No, on behalf of all of us, we're sorry if there are a little bit of glitches. I don't think there will be because Dave, Brian, and Johnny, you guys are killing the game. Yeah. Super cool. Let me get to our announcements. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Give it a big clap out. Big clap out. So cool. Um, our announcements for this morning first is... We are right in the middle of our 14 days of prayer, and for those of you that have chosen to fast, fasting as well, it is not too late for you to sign up. And some people are like, what is it about? Like, why are we? Um, we just want to invite God to move, to move in our church, to move in our people's lives, but also to move in our community. Um, it is like not shocking, maybe pre-planned a little bit, that this is going on right in the midst of the election and those results that we will likely be getting on Tuesday. And we just know that we don't understand it all, but we know that God gives power to his people as they <laughs> in prayer. And we've watched God answer prayers when we say, God, yes, God, would you show up? And so we would love, if you haven't yet had that opportunity to sign up to pray, and you don't have to fast, some of you are just like, I cannot do that, we will take your prayers, and God will hear your prayers as well. We have a guide that we will email to you, and you can break it up into little 10-minute increments or 5-minute increments or spend an hour, um, however you would like to do that. You don't have to pray for all the things on the list. It really is just to kind of get things going. If this, if you're newer to prayer and you're like, I don't know what I would do if I skip a meal because I'm going to fast, how would I do this? So that's just hopefully helping you, but you don't have to be confined to that. So the way that you would sign up for that is to text the word pray fast to the 406-3660 number, and that will immediately send you to a link for signup.com. And then a day before you are going to pray and fast, a guide will come out to you and a reminder email as well. And so Alice Fan is doing a fantastic job of organizing this for us. If you have any questions at all, though, reach out to us via our email. And you can find that on the website if you don't know where to find our email. And we would like to connect with you and get to do everything that you need to be able to participate in that. And then I am so excited that the 14 days of prayer and fasting will culminate and end in a six o'clock prayer vigil here in the parking lot that will be socially distanced. Once you arrive, you're kind of frozen where you are. We're asking that people park on the street to allow the parking lot to be open. There will be childcare next door in the form of a movie like we're doing right now during this church service. That starts at 6 o'clock p.m., so arrive just a little bit early to get your kids settled if you're going to have them watching a movie. Um, and you don't need to RSVP for that prayer vigil to come, but you do need to RSVP for the child care so that we know how many kids are there and to kind of prepare ourselves to make sure that that's a successful time for them. It will be one hour that we're going to hold ourselves to for that praying and fasting. It will be beautiful, hopefully some candlelight, and there will be some a cappella singing maybe. I mean, we haven't planned the whole thing out yet, but the things that we have, I'm so excited for, and I think that it will be a really, really beautiful night and a really cool way for us to be able to come together in community. And what a beautiful display for our neighbors to see us standing in our parking lot crying out to God for his movement. Um, it'll either be like they'll hate it or they'll love it. So I'm hoping they love it. <laughs> That's the coffee speaking. That's the coffee speaking. Um, baptism. 
So next Sunday morning, the 8th, and for those of you watching at home as well, we will not have the live stream and we will not have church service in the morning because we're going to be doing that prayer vigil in lieu of our Sunday service. So we are talking about the possibility of live streaming that prayer vigil, but not certain that we can do it. So please come. If you're comfortable coming, please come. We will probably let you know the day of whether or not that stream would be available to you. Um, so don't plan on it is all that I'll say. The baptism service is happening, though. The next Sunday, we will begin to meet at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings very regularly from, from the 15th forward, and we're going to start with a baptism service on the 15th. We have reinforced the stage here. We have a portable baptistry that's going to go over here, and um, it has been plumbed for hot water, so you don't even have to experience, yeah, right? A lake baptism is in the past. Um, right, Tony? <laughs> Tony got baptized in the downpour. He was baptized before he was baptized. So <laughs> many of our brook viewers who have been baptized have also um, endured the rain and uh, sideways hail and sleet <laughs> to be baptized. So we're so excited to be able to gather together and to celebrate this step in people's lives. And so I just want to encourage those of you that are like, maybe I would come to church. Will you come? Will you come and celebrate with these people the movement of God in their lives as they make this public declaration of their desire to follow Jesus with all of who they are? Um, okay. Every Sunday, I know, now I just go ad hoc. Uh, every Sunday, you can sign up for church. Like, we have all of church services from now through the end of November on our website, so and child care is there as well. So if you're just like, I know I want to come every Sunday, just do it now, and then you don't have to worry about it. We are still RSVPing people, not because we're just too full, but we're trying to be thoughtful about um, the health department's um, longing for us to know who's here so that if something happens with one of you, they can have contact tracing a little bit. So. Um, we don't keep long lists of records, and we're not taking attendance and going, oh, Beulah, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, that's not what it's about, but please RSVP, and that just helps us to make sure that we're being in compliance with what the um, health department recommends for us. We love it when you fill out your online communication cards. We love hearing from you throughout the week. We have a team of people that prays for you when those requests come in. So please continue to use that digital communication card. And that's all that I have. Jason, want me to pray? <laughs> I like praying. I like praying. I'm going to do it. God, as Jason comes up, um, would you go before him in this moment? Would you prepare our hearts? Would you still our minds? Would you help us to let go of whatever... The chaos might have been in getting here. I'm, I'm personally thankful for that extra hour of sleep this morning. And um, I just pray again, like I did before, that your spirit would dwell in this place, that we would be able to meet with you, that we wouldn't just um, learn things about you, but that we would be transformed by you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. You're not going to leave that up here for me? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, dear. You guys, what a year. Have you, like, stopped and thought about, like, some of you, that's all you're thinking about. So, um, but you guys, 2020, this is, this is one for the record books. Uh, New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg recently made the point that we have gone through an unparalleled series of crises. Um, it, is there a way? I, well, it's definitely ringing, Brian. Okay, I'm going to keep talking. You just, you just make it magic. Make me sound good. Do something miraculous. Uh, many of the hardships are similar to things that America has endured before. It's just that we have never endured all of them in a series in one year. So when you think about it, okay, let's just go year in review. The year started off like 1974 with an impeachment crisis. 
You guys remember that? Yeah, I hardly even remember that. It feels like a decade ago. You guys, it was the beginning of this year. And then it quickly became 1918, a global pandemic. And then it turned into 1929, an economic crash. Then it became 1968 with urban unrest all across our nation, not to mention Seattle's unique spin on it, because we have to put our own unique spin on everything. And so we had the chop zone that made national headlines. And then on the West Coast, the protests died down because in large part, they got smoked out. I mean, we experienced like once in a generation wildfires, which forced all of us back indoors again. And then this fall with our current election cycle, there's so much division. In fact, sociologists have done research on the state of our nation. And you guys, the US is actually more divided than it has been since the Civil War. So if you're here and you're feeling out of balance or out of sorts or just plain off, welcome to church. <laughs> you are not alone. 2020 has been unreal. We are, we are more isolated and more divided than many of us have ever known. And so heading into this fall, we decided as a staff, we decided, you know what, we need to talk about this. And so today we're coming to the end of what has been a four-week series that we have called Together Again. So for the last few weeks, we've been asking the question, how can we, like right now in COVID, uh, be the church? How can we be the church, like right now? Um, and and I, I firmly believe that we need each other more than ever. We, like we really, really need each other. But we're going to have to get creative, and we're going to have to tweak things, and we're going to have to honor one another's comfort levels and be willing to operate in less than ideal circumstances. But the call to love and support one another, it still stands. And we need it as much now as we ever have, more so. So in week one, we looked at a a famous passage in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was writing to the young church in Corinth. And he wanted to remind them of, of their main objective. He wanted them to remember why it is that they come together, the ultimate goal in everything that they do. And so here's what Paul wrote to his friends in Corinth. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have what? Love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So no matter what else is going on in a church family, if the family isn't practicing love more and more and more, it's missing it. And so looking at Paul's warning to the Corinthians, we said love is, just kind of following his his arguments, love is more important than, number one, dynamic experiences with the Holy Spirit. Love is more important than spiritual knowledge and insight. And love is more important than extreme religious devotion. And guys, it is amazing how easily spirituality gets redefined. And the importance of love and living love just gets washed away. Now, as we said, experiencing the Holy Spirit is critical, right? Growing in our spiritual knowledge and insight is vital. And engaging in regular spiritual practices is essential. In fact, you will not grow in love the way that God wants you to without these things. But never, ever mistake them for the ultimate goal. The goal is love. And these things are only working right if they are continually producing greater and greater amounts of love. And so Paul continues in what have become very famous words, And he paints a picture of what love is. He writes, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. How nice would it be if that's the way we all live these days? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And today I just want to begin this message by revisiting something that we've talked about a fair bit 
in the last few years, and I want to launch into it with a very simple question. We're going to spend about five minutes on this. Here's the question. What makes you happy? Like, really? What makes you happy? What do you believe makes you happy? That is one of the most basic of all human questions. But at the end of the day, at the end of your life, the way that you have answered that question will, for the most part, determine how you've spent your life. Because we all organize our lives around the pursuit of happiness to some extent. So what is it that truly makes you happy? What is it that you, you truly can't thrive without? Now, again, we've talked about this a fair bit over the years, and we've discussed an idea that many of you may remember. Um, what makes you happy? Well, here's something that I think most of us have discovered. For most of us, if not all of us, happiness is more about who than what. Brian, I think there's still a little bit of a ring to this, and it's, uh, I don't know if there's, is there anything I can do about it? No? Okay. All right. No, you're killing it. And, and so you guys, by the way, we moved church to 10 o'clock. And I got in autopilot this morning, and I was ready for church at 1030. So I rolled in here like 30 seconds. I'm like, why is it? We moved to Sundays, and people are so eager to get here. Look at how early everybody is. Yeah, and I, so I didn't do a sound check on this thing. I didn't get Johnny my notes to be following along. These guys are killing it. Love lived, baby. <laughs> okay, so who, uh, happiness is more about who than what, when you really think about it. And, and this is one of the earliest lessons we learn in life. We, many of us learned it in the backyard, because at some point, you were a little kid, right, and you're playing in the backyard, and it didn't, like you could have just been playing in the dirt. It didn't really matter what you had, because there were a bunch of who's there. And, and the who's were all that mattered. And, and then you went to elementary school, and if you found a group of who's, if you were known and you were accepted and you had a place to belong, then it didn't really matter so much what you had. And what mattered most in middle school and high school for, for most of us? I mean, what, wasn't it being included in the right group of who's? So happiness is more about who than what. But I think we need to take this even a step further. Here's something else. As long as you are all about you, you won't be happy. The more you're about you, the less happy you'll be. Because here's the deal. The more you focus on you, the less you focus on the yous around you. In fact, if you were able to get everything you want... You were able to get yourself exactly the way you want yourself. You were the right size, and you were the right shape, and you had the right income, and you drove the right car, everything. Like, if you, if you, got, if you actually got you exactly the way you want you, it still won't make you happy. But this is not usually the way that we see it. We just sort of naturally think, well, if I could just get certain things, if I could just have certain things, if I could just live a certain way, if I could just have a certain level of health, have a certain look, if I could just possess this thing, if I had the freedom to do these things, I would be happy. But the truth is, if you obsess on any of this stuff, you will actually end up less happy. And here's why. Because at its core, all of this is you being about you. And this is where we encounter the inverse law of happiness. And it's this. If you want to be filled up, you have to find a way to pour yourself out. Okay, we've talked about this, right? But I invite you, think about the happiest people you know. And here's what I bet you'll find. Here's the common denominator. I bet you'll find that it's not body fat or income level or career success or accomplishments. When you see people that are truly, truly happy, the common denominator is, one way or another, they have found a way to give themselves away. They have learned how to pour themselves out. They have discovered a consistent context for it. 
They know that their life is making a meaningful contribution to other lives. And it really comes down to this. There are two ways of living. I can make it all about me, or I can find ways to pour myself out. Now, to steer our conversation back to who we are as a church, we exist to live love. Church is, is, not, a, church is not a building where we gather. It's, it's not even a service that we go to. Ultimately, a church is a family that we belong to. And when you look at the ancient description of the very first church, what you see is not a building and you don't see a service. What you see is a family. And what an extraordinary family it was. Now, we've looked at this all throughout this series, but let's look one more time real fast. This is the first gathering of Christians that is ever described. Here's what it says. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. At this point, there are about 3,000 Christians in the entire world, and they're all gathering in Jerusalem. Almost all of them are Jewish, and they are devoted to, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we go, of course they would. They, they want to know about Jesus. They want to know about what he taught and what he did, what it all means. But right away, we are told something else. We're told that they devoted themselves also to fellowship, to breaking bread, to gathering for meals together, this space where first century people would connect the most. This was the most social space in their world, eating meals together. Continuing on, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So God's power and blessing was obvious in this new community. Jesus, Jesus uh, just as the authority of Jesus was accredited by miracles, the apostles' authority also was accredited in that same way. And this is, this is like awesome stuff. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Again, it was not about a building, and it was not about a service. It was about community, and that community truly loved one another. It says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Think about that. You ever sold property just to give money to someone in need? In other words, when people in the community were in need, those that had the ability, they provided and they cared for them. Those that had property would occasionally sell it to provide. They'd sell property to care for their brothers and their sisters in need. You guys, I think this is what Jesus had in mind. This is the kind of family that he wanted. And what you see is this family of people just growing closer and closer this community bound together by their new faith, bound together by the reality of the love of Jesus and his sacrifice for them. Listen to the rest of what was happening. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. These people were poor. These people were marginalized. Life was hard, but they found love and they found joy in community together. We're told they enjoyed the favor of all the people. What in the world does that mean? I don't know. But it sounds awesome to me. And so the final thing that we're told makes perfect sense. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, sure. Sure. They had the most gracious, loving community ever seen. This little community came to embody the inverse law of happiness. They had truly discovered that if you want to be filled up, you have to find a way to pour yourself out. And they lived it in every arena of their lives. But the real power, I think, was that they lived it together. And I love what we're told in the middle of this description of community. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. These, these people found, uh, uh, people who had means found ways to provide for those that were in need. And I think that this was a huge part of the joy in the community. There was this spirit of generosity and this eagerness to serve. Now, why did this community led by the apostles embody this kind of spirit? Well, I think this is exactly the picture that Jesus had painted for them. This was his example to them, and this was his instruction to them. I, th I think about his famous words on the night of the Last Supper. 
Jesus was, was leaving and trying to drive home his vision for his followers. And that night, Jesus demonstrated his love by becoming like a slave. Right? You remember the room. You remember the scene. It's the Last Supper. And Jesus took the lowliest position, and he washed his disciples' feet. And then he invited his guys to adopt that same disposition. And he said this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus invited his disciples into this vision again and again and again. And for, for so many reasons, they couldn't get it, right? Like, they just couldn't get it. They just struggled to, 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 to see it. But then he, he washed their feet. And then he went to the cross. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and eventually they got it. And then they led a community that got it. And guys, I, I want to be a part of a community that gets it. I, I want to I be a place where people are owning the idea that the best way to be filled up is to find a way to pour ourselves out. And if there was ever a time to serve each other, it's now. If there was ever a time that we had tangible needs to meet, it's now. If there was ever a time that we actually needed each other, it's now. And it's always been a part of, of my dream for our church to, to sort of resemble this Acts 2 model. It's always been my dream for Brookview that we would operate like that. And you guys, here's what I'll tell you. In this last season, I have seen breathtaking things in our church, in our community. And we have seen acts of generosity and service and kindness that are unprecedented. They are deep and, and they are many. And I just want to say this morning, I am so proud of who we are. I wasn't going to say this. I got a bunch of pastor buddies, and I meet with them. And, and, and through this season, we've talked about what's going on in our churches. And I thought, you know, with, you know, I don't know if you knew this, church attendance has been down a little. <laughs> and so I kind of thought, oh, this has been hard, right? And then I talk to those guys and hear what's going on in their churches and the division and the anger and the way people are lashing out at each other. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And then I look at our people and the way that you guys have served one another and loved one another and, and bared one another's burdens. It is mind-blowing, you guys. It really is. And so today what I wanna I wanna do is just share with you a fraction of what's happened among us. And I could honestly tell you story after story after story, but um, I know that uh, many of you want to watch the Seahawks beat the Niners. You do. So I'm going to limit this to three, to three examples from this past season. And um, these, are, these are awesome. And as I, as I share these, my goal is really just to remind us of, of a simple thing. We need each other. We really do. We need each other. Um, first story comes from the, the Den Herder family. Um, do we have that image? Yeah. What a beautiful family. Um, so this is Dave and Heidi and their kids, Clarity and Jameson. And for those of you that don't know them, they've been coming to Brookview for just a couple years. Um, and in, in, these, in these last couple, Heidi has been in a life group led by Jeff and Monica Satterthwaite. And, um, and so this summer, the Den Herders went through some really hard times. And Heidi reached out to a friend who reached out to Jen. And Jen reached out to Heidi's life group, and they wrapped around that family in just, I mean, magnificent ways. So toward the end of the summer, Heidi sent a thank you to her life group. She emailed the life group and, and to a handful of others that had surrounded them in this season where they were, they were really in need. And so I just want to read for you guys the email that Heidi sent. So this is story number one. Here's the email. She writes, Dear life group, plus a few others, oh, you guys, Jeff just dropped off your gift. And I'm feeling overwhelmed with thankfulness. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your incredible generosity and love. And they dropped off the gift of financial contributions and, and a bunch of other things. 
She, I also just wanted to share a little bit with you about how incredible God has been to us these last couple of weeks. Dave has been mostly out of work except for a few small contracts since the beginning of May. His ongoing depression, which is at its worst in the summer, plus sensory processing issues and possibly some other things we're looking into, have made it nearly impossible to cope with just the stress of family life and the burden of looking for work has been almost insupportable. A week and a half ago, we realized that we could only pay bills for one more month and we had no leads for upcoming work. Dave staying home with the children is also not an option, and I also don't have the necessary skills to support our family without pursuing more education. When I realized the dire place we were in, I just sunk to my knees and begged God for help. That was Saturday. On Monday, we got a check in the mail from a friend who was not aware of our current situation. She said they had put aside some money for God to direct, and God told her to send it to us. She said that God was holding me in the palm of his hand. It was a substantial amount, enough to pay our mortgage for a month. That morning, I also woke up with the song Shelter by Vertical Worship going over and over in my head, especially the part that says, I will hold on to your promise. You will not abandon me. I am safe. I am safe. I flipped open my Bible randomly and landed on Psalm 91. I read the psalm, listened to the song, and realized that Shelter is based on Psalm 91. Then I realized that over the last month, this kind of scripture guidance has happened to me multiple times. God had led me in prayer to two other scriptures, and I had then randomly opened my Bible to those very places. The two other scriptures were Psalm 27 and Isaiah 41. So then I read those scriptures all together, and I was amazed. They all speak of a backdrop of hardship, scarcity, war, sickness, etc., and then say, paraphrasing, don't fear, I am with you. If God is your dwelling place, you will be safe. In the last couple of days, we also got news that we don't owe our third quarter self-employment taxes, which is a big relief. And a family member pointed us to some business assistance that we feel hopeful about. Last weekend, I reached out to another Brookview friend and let her know what was happening in our life. I just needed to talk and be heard and ask for prayer. I wasn't even expecting any of this help, but I was wrong. From babysitting to Costco runs to gift cards to cash gifts, written to her life group and a few others, you guys have wrapped around us and I am overwhelmed in a good way with how well this community loves and so we gratefully receive your love as a gift from each of you, but even more as a gift from God through each of you. That's what makes it all the more precious to us. Thank you, friends. Love, Heidi, Dave, Clarity, and Jameson. You guys, we need each other. Let me share another example. Many of you know that at the end of the summer, Vin Nguyen had a massive heart attack. Um, we've got image. This is Vin and, and his family. So daughter Hannah, wife Kim, um, son Alex, and his brand new bride, clearly in the picture, uh, Marissa. Um, I did the wedding right here with just a few people in the room. And you guys, I crushed it. <laughs> this was a good day. The day of Vin's heart attack, not so much. And um, for those of you that know this family, th you guys, these are amazing people. And for years and years, they have poured themselves out to serve others. But in this season, they found themselves being the ones in need. Now, those of you that know Vin, you know Vin is a runner. And toward the end of the summer, Vin was running on a trail, and he had a, a heart attack while running, and he really should have died. I mean, all the reports, he should have died. Um, and there are so many miracles in this story, and he is, he is now back home, he's recovering, and he's doing very well. And I went to visit him last Sunday afternoon, and we just had a great time together catching up. And he shared some stuff with me that was amazing, and so I asked, would you be willing to write that so that, so that people could hear it? And so he did. Here's what he wrote. He said, as some of you may know, I recently suffered a heart attack, and I'm on my way to recovery. After being in the hospital for almost four weeks, I was just discharged to return home. Nothing felt so sweet as walking into the house and taking an extra long shower. <laughs> yes, there is no place like home. After my conversation with Jason a few days ago, he asked if I could jot down a few notes from my recent episode, so here goes. 
First, I want to thank God for his watching over me and directing all the events and activities, enabling me to survive and recover. He is truly an awesome and faithful God. Second, and what, and, and what I want to highlight in the rest of my notes are the people who God brought into my life. The strangers who kept me alive. By the way, there were two people that, that were there when he had this heart attack that they worked in tandem to save his life. The village that sustains me and the family that has shown me unwavering love, support, and dedication. The strangers include nurses, doctors, and therapists who were incredibly supportive during my hospital stay. These healthcare professionals were encouraging and made sure I got the best care and rehab possible. Included also are the people who made sure I was even able to make it to the hospital alive. They are my heroes. And thankfully, my younger brother and I were able to talk to each of them. You guys, this is amazing. Okay. My older brother was able to track down the people who had direct involvement on the day of my heart attack. How cool is that? My, my first conversation, so Vin called them. When I met with him on Sunday, he had just called them a day or two before I sat down with him. He said, my first conversation with Peter, he was the EMT who drove the ambulance to the side of my heart attack and who transported me to the hospital. Peter said, if it were not for the person who performed CPR on me and the person who gave such great instructions so the ambulance could arrive on time, I would not have made it. Okay, this guy gave, gave him CPR for a long time. One guy's giving him CPR, the other guy's on the phone directing the ambulance. Unbelievable. The next conversation was with Tim, the cyclist who performed CPR on me. Not only did he keep my heart pumping, but he also did so without breaking my ribs. Thank you, Tim. Tim has been a physical therapist for 20 years and gets recertified in CPR every couple of years, never having performed CPR on anyone. When he saw me fall face down face first, he knew I was having a heart attack. Tim said his CPR training just kicked in. My next conversation was with Boyd, the runner who saw me fall and someone performing CPR. He called 911 and calmly guided the ambulance to where we were. Okay, they're on a trail. This was not easy to find. My conversation with Boyd was emotional since he said at the time he was having some marital issues. By being able to help me with my heart attack, he felt God's involvement. Boyd said he hoped to use his experience with my heart attack to try and mend the relationship with his wife. All three said how cool it was to talk with someone they tried to save and to learn that I was doing okay. For me, I am grateful that I was able to talk with each of them directly and to express my gratitude. He says, additionally, there were a group of strangers on the scene I never got to meet or thank. Boyd said he was on the phone with 911 and Tim performing CPR. Can you get the visual of this in your mind? There were people who saw what was happening and just stopped to pray. How incredible is that? People who did not know who I was, but just lifting me up in their prayers. That is such a cool, inspiring, and humbling picture. It reminds me that when I feel I can't do anything, I can always pray. The village that sustains me includes all the people in my life, my work life, and home life. I've worked at the same company for over 28 years, even though our company name has changed over the years. It's currently CenturyLink. The friendships I've developed at work have remained constant. The outpouring of support and concern from my current and, and past coworkers has been overwhelming. A great part of this village has also been Brookview Church. From Jason and Jen to many partners of the church, from life group members to pew buddies. We don't have pews, I don't, you know, I don't know. That's for you, Eloise. That's for you, Vince Pew Buddy. Pew Buddies. Friends and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for your prayers, support, and love. Some of you reached out to personally comfort Kim and our kids. Some of you prayed with the family in person and virtually. Even though my heart has seen better days and is currently on the mends, it is full of gratitude and appreciation for the village that God has placed me into. The last group I want to highlight is my family. Before my heart attack, I knew that God had blessed me with a family that is weird and quirky, but also supportive, loving, and dedicated to one another. After my heart attack, it's confirmed that my family is weird and quirky. <laughs> and other things, too. I did not realize how dire my situation was until I regained consciousness in the hospital. When I was checked in at the hospital, the rule was only one family member at a time could be in the room with me, right? 
But given how bad I looked, the hospital staff made an exception. Okay, the general consensus at the hospital was he was not going to make it. He maybe had a few hours or a day left. So they allowed Kim, our kids, and my brothers to be in the room with me as I laid unconscious on the bed. After it looked like I would pull through, that exception was quickly canceled. <laughs> and one, the, the one visitor policy was enforced. Between Kim and our kids and my brothers, there was always a fam family member with me every day. My extended family of in-laws, nieces, and nephews all made visits to comfort our family as I recovered in the hospital. Special thanks to Kim's mom, who has made sure our fridge is stocked with soups and easy-to-swallow food. I am blessed with a wonderful family. At the heart of this family for me are Kim, Hannah, Alex, and Marissa. I could not have made it through without the love and care of my wife, son, and daughters. Thanks, fam. And he adds this. This is pretty cool. Just so you know, there's a weird and quirky side to this family. We had a, a family FaceTime call after I regained consciousness. By the way, Ben's brothers have, like, I think they've all had heart attacks. So they're like, oh, it's your turn, dude. <laughs> and so he says, one of my brothers asked, tell us the truth, Vinny. When you were unconscious that first week, did you talk to mom and dad? He says, our mom and dad passed away 27 and 30 years ago, respectively. So he says, yep, that's, that's my family, and I'm thankful for each and every one of them. Thanks for giving me a chance to count my blessings and highlighting some of the people who have helped me with my heart attack and recovery. God has given me a restored life. I'm so grateful that he watched over me. I have not figured out yet what his invitation is for me and what my resp responding plan will be. For now, I will pray for all the first responders, caregivers, my village, and my family. God bless, and may he always be your guide and restorer. You guys, we need each other. Okay, one more story. And this one is going to come via video. Um, and to be honest with you, you don't really need me to set this one up because it's pretty self-explanatory because it's so well put together from a guy that puts videos together. Let's just roll this thing. Um, coronavirus is like our worst nightmare that we're <laughs> that we're living as a reality right now. My husband Amos has an autoimmune disease that for the past seven years has just been kind of chronic pneumonia that's just kind of morphed into a technical just the lung disease that's that's what they're gonna call it lung disease just because of all the lung damage so when you have a daddy and a husband that's super vulnerable, that's just always on the back of your mind. And so I'm a teacher and I'm with kids <laughs> all day and, and my kids are in school. So that risk of exposure, but weighing that out with, we sort of have to do normal life too. We can't lock our kids away for years on end. So the first route we went is we were gonna hire a contractor and <clears throat> turn our garage into some kind of living space so that if one of us was exposed then we would have somewhere to send daddy and um, that for a handful of reasons got really complicated and started taking way too long and we had to pull the plug on that project and we kind of were just like I guess we're just going to see how things go and wait for a vaccine but um, calling Jen Jen said hey I got a team ready to go like they are ready to go and so I was like oh okay once Emily said yes to us helping their family with the need that they had, and the, a way that we got the broader church involved was first we went to her life group and the people that she's been doing life with for several years and reached out and just said, would anybody be willing to help? And then at the beginning of COVID and all the shutdowns, we had talked about announcements at church on Sunday, we posted online that if anyone was in need of help or if anyone would be willing to be on a distribution list of people that could help should something come up, would they let us know? And so I just went to both of those places for help and the response was really cool. Welcome to the crew of Misfits at the Callens. Hi, I'm Gerard. Tony. I'm Shane. And this is Team Callen. We had the privilege of working on Emily and uh, Amos's house. And we're here to tell you a little bit about the story and all of how that went. I'll turn my cell phone off. Thank you, good. <laughs> That'll have to be chopped up in. To me, it was fulfilling a purpose. There was 
uh, something that needed to be done, somebody who needed something specific. It's just cool to actually have that community because in church we talk about community all the time and we all want to be a part of a community, but it actually felt like I was getting to know people who I normally don't get to hang out with. Like I get to see people in church and we come and go and we just say, hey, how's it going? But to be able to spend a lot of time with Tony and Shane actually working on a project and actually working for somebody even within the church who had a need that we were somehow able to fulfill just from our experiences and our skills that we've gained it was really cool. It was rewarding and it was it felt like this is what we're here to do. I haven't uh, been coming to the church very long. I was coming like two weeks before COVID started. Specifically working with people from church, it was really cool because now whenever I go back to church, I'm going to know at least two people pretty well that I've worked with. And now that I know these guys, like I don't, I don't feel that, that disconnect or that fear of going and talking to other people that I don't know because now I know them. I get home and Rebecca asks, how was it? And I have energy and I'm like, it was awesome. Uh, the guys are awesome. Knowing that I was serving and volunteering my time doing this, even though it was work I usually do, it just was something that filled me up. They swooped in and built us this, we, we call it Daddy's Box in the garage, but um, it's a really nice room. It's actually nicer than a lot of our house. <laughs> so um, it's been awesome. And they were bringing their kids and their kids were getting to play with my kids and of course, just like everybody's kids, they're starving for some playtime and just the little things along the way, you know, like their kids would show up in masks to add an extra layer of protection for our family. And that just means so much to us. Come on. I think the icing on the cake was I was settling up with Shane going, hey Shane, how much, you know, how much do we owe you for supplies and all of that? And he kind of kept putting me off a little bit and I was like, okay, he's working it out. And then I got a card in the mail that just said, hey, your project has been covered 100% and um, your Brookview family loves you. Like that was, I mean, everything was so far above what you would expect. And um, I don't know, we're forever grateful. And um, I feel like my heart's like changed forever too. Like the, the fact that people would serve our family in this way is incredible. Is it weird to do all the work and then make the video that <laughs> pumps it up? <laughs> I was telling Tony, I, man, I watched that last night. He got it done last night. I'm like, if you lose your day job, you need to go work for like HBO documentaries. <laughs> you guys, we, we need each other. Now more than ever. We need each other. And so I just, I just want to close and ask a simple question. Um, what will it take for us to have more of this? What will it take for us to have more of this? Like, how do we continue to be this kind of community for each other? How do we do more of it? How do we see more of it? And, you know, for months and months, Jen and Casey and I and, and lots of other leaders in our church, we've been thinking about this a lot. And to close this series together again, I just want to mention three things that it will take. And these are not rocket science. You know all three of these things. But I just, I just want to remind us of things that are really important. And the first is, we have to be willing to invite people in. Like the hard part about being in need is that it's super humbling. But if you and I aren't willing to let people in, how in the world can they help? Van had a heart attack, right? And, and that was not real easy to hide. I mean, he was in need. That, that family was in need. But I think especially of, of Heidi, and I think especially of Emily, they could have like just suffered in their need and lived in isolation, and nobody would have ever known, and none of this stuff would have ever happened, but they reached out to people who love them, and those people asked permission to reach out to others, and that's when an army got mobilized. So if we're going to love and serve each other, we have to be willing to invite people in. 
And, and the way that care works best in our church is that it starts with our groups, life groups, ID groups. Our, our hope is that as many people as possible will, will get themselves into groups because our life groups are, are the place where we just ask that you to be, you be open and you share your needs with the people who know you, the people who, who, who you trust most and know best. And then if those, if those needs exceed what the group has the resources for, which sometimes they very much do, then we ask the group to reach out to us as well. And at that point, we can start to begin to mobilize the broader church. But start with your group. If you're in a group, start with your group. Be authentic and invite people in. Now, if, if that doesn't make sense for you, you're not in a group or you're just in a kind of a weird, going through something weird, then, then find a friend that you can trust. But you've got to invite somebody in. You have to start somewhere. Because the reality is if nobody knows, nobody can help. So I just want to ask a quick question this morning. Who are the people in your life that you're inviting in? Who are the people that you let see into the hard stuff and the mess in your life? Because we've all got hard stuff. We all do. We've all got mess, every one of us. So who for you are you letting in? Who are you letting in? And is there a way for you to step into that deeper? Is there a burden that you need to share with somebody and begin to let some people know what's going on with you? So if we're to have more people caring for more people, we have to be willing to invite people in. And then second, you have to be willing to pour yourself out, right? When when needs come up, we have to be the kind of people that actually respond. We have to be willing to be inconvenienced. We have to be willing to be generous. And you guys, the truth is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because to be honest, when you guys hear of real needs, you crush them. You guys, I mean, when Jen organized help for the Callens and some of it was financial, One of the things that really stuck out to Jen, one of the things that just really was like a big deal to her was that many of the families that donated to the Callens, they were in need themselves. And we knew that. So we're throwing it out to everybody, like equal opportunity to help the Callens. And the people, several of the people pouring money and pouring resources into that were people that were themselves in need. Unbelievable. Like Jen was just like, just goosebumpy. And I like that. You guys are so good at loving each other. You just are. But for us to do more of this, we have to continue to be people who are willing to pour ourselves out. And then finally, and this is a really big one. If we're really going to care for each other at a heart level, we have to be willing to live in community with one another. And when I think of like Heidi and I think of Vin and Emily, in each case, you guys, they have lived in community for an extended period of time. Like when it comes to church, Vin and Kim have been in, they've been in life groups for years. And they have served in various ministries and just participated in stuff that's happening with the church family. And when Vin had his uh, heart attack, Jeff Satterthwaite, who had led the groups that Vin and Kim had been in most of the time for most of the years, they reached out to not only their current group, they reached out to anybody that they could think of that had ever been in a group with them. And over the years, you guys, that was a lot of people because they had invested themselves in a lot of people. And so there was this army that was praying for them. And so Vin and Kim have been willing to live life in community and the same with Heidi and Emily. But you know what else? Lots of other people have been living in community with them. And because of those relationships, love was so much deeper in the midst of all this. And you think about it, and you go, well, couldn't we just have like a sign up, you know, like somebody posts needs and someone else posts resources, and somebody posts needs and somebody, like, you could all just come to church services and go home and share our needs via some online format. And yes, we would probably get some needs matching, you know, like a dating site or something. But you guys, it's the relationships that make this stuff so beautiful. And the relationships only come from being willing to do life together. It's people being willing to show up again and again and again on a Wednesday night, week after week, even when they're tired, even when they went last week and it was kind of awkward. 
It's signing up to do it again year after year with people in community. It's people that are hanging out for dinner. It's people that are having coffee together. It's people that are watching games together. It's people that are doing life together. It's life in community. Now, I realize that all of us are very much in different places, different circumstances, different things that are happening. I totally get it. And so some people, you know, you, you can't be in groups and your ability to connect is limited. I get it. Totally get it. Okay, this is not a shame thing at all. I'm just saying the more, the more we move toward each other, the more we can love each other well. That's just how life works. So is there a way for you to move toward community a little bit? To take a step toward community? Is there a, a step that you can take into deeper community? And um, as we wrap this up, I just want to highlight two things that Jen already mentioned that you could actually do this week. Um, and these are not deep, deep community, and they're not long, ongoing commitments, but two things this week. First, we're in the middle of this 14 days of prayer and fasting, where we're, we're praying for one another, we're praying for our church, we're praying for our community, and we're praying for our nation. Does our nation need it? Do we need it? We do. And so if you're not signed up for that and you're not participating in that, you can do that. And by the way, if you go, I don't know if I want to fast. I guess I can't pray. Actually, you can. You can still pray and not fast. <laughs> God allows that and so do we. So if you wanted to sign up for it again, this is where you would go. You would text pray fast to 425-406-3660 and then we'll get you signed up. It'll take you to the link where you get signed up. You can sign up for the day that makes sense for you and then a day or two before it's your day, you'll get resources for walking you through prayer and, and, and walking you through fasting if you want to do both of them. And then as Jen mentioned, okay, next Sunday, we're going to gather in community to pray. And I think it's going to be beautiful. Um, this is so much of what we've done. We have to be limited in numbers. We have to be so uh, careful. But this is going to be outdoors. We have enough space that we can socially distance. This is something that, that it could embody the vast majority of us. And so I would encourage you to make that a priority and come from 6 to 7 o'clock next week. We don't even have church. We're not even asking you to do two spiritual things next weekend. Just one thing. To close this series, I, I just want to come back to the, the, question, the main question. How can we be the church right now in COVID? Because you guys, right now, more than ever, we, we need each other. And to do this, we're going to have to tweak things. We're going to have to get creative. We're going to have to honor one another's comfort levels. We're going to have to be willing to operate in less than ideal circumstances. How willing are you to operate in less than ideal circumstances? Because the call to love and support one another still stands. And right now, you guys, I think we need this more than ever. So how can we be the church right now? How can we be the church right now? Father in heaven, I thank you for the ways that we have been the church in this last season and how meaningful that has been to so many. But I pray that you would just continue to move in us. I pray that you would give us passion, motivation, creativity. I pray that you would help us to to overcome whatever our hangups are with um, things where we, we're perfectly capable of being in community and yet there's something that's not perfectly ideal about it and so we're kind of holding it at arm's length. God, would you help us? Would you help us to recognize that the best way to be filled up is to find a way to pour ourselves out? Would you help us be a community that more and more and more knows the joy of what it is to pour ourselves out for one another? And God, would you be right at the center of all of it? We need you. Amen.